So let's look here at chapter 14 on page number 450. Now this is an important chapter, but there's just not a lot of stuff in the chapter. So it's gonna be kind of quick, but it's still a lot of important information nonetheless. This chapter is all about residential design and construction here on page 450 and page 451. So let's start here at the middle of page 450 with this concept of MPRs or minimum property requirements. Minimum property requirements are physical characteristics that a property must meet in order to qualify for an FHA or VA loan. Now, you might remember from chapter nine that an FHA and a VA product are both government insured loans. So FHA is a government insured product. VA is a VA guaranteed product. I'll give you a quick example. You go to Wells Fargo to get an FHA loan. Wells Fargo checks your credit, checks your income, and approves you for the loan. Wells Fargo is, if it's an FHA loan, Wells Fargo knows if you don't pay FHA, or if you don't pay Wells Fargo rather, FHA will come in and cover Wells Fargo's loss. So again, FHA is an FHA insured loan. It's made by a lender, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, One West Bank. The bank makes the loan, but FHA will insure that loan. Now, if you look here on page 450, what are MPRs then? Well, MPRs are relevant for FHA and VA transactions. If you get a FHA loan from Wells Fargo and then don't pay Wells Fargo, again, FHA will cover Wells Fargo's loss. Then FHA will sell the property. That's called a HUD home. You might have heard of a HUD home before. That's a, a, a loan that uh, was done on a property that was FHA. Wells Fargo was then not paid by the borrower, and FHA will cover Wells Fargo's loss. FHA then sells the property. Now, FHA is a federal program, so there's literally thousands of properties all over the country that have FHA-insured loans on them. Now, they know, FHA does, that they have some risk, right, in insuring all of these loans. FHA on page number 450 is in a position where they got to make sure that the properties that they're insuring these loans on aren't garbage. So FHA basically has a laundry list of physical characteristics that a property must meet in order to qualify for an FHA loan. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, FHA requires that all the properties that have FHA insured loans on them have electrical wiring inside of a conduit. A conduit is like a raceway for electrical wiring. You can't have exposed electrical wiring on an FHA insured property. Why? Because the government knows, FHA knows, if they have to take back that property and resell it, it's going to be hard to sell a property that has exposed electrical wiring everywhere. There's a question on the test about ceiling height potentially. Right next to MPRs, I would write minimum ceiling height equals 96 inches or 8 feet. The minimum ceiling height for an FHA insured property is 96 inches or 8 feet. What that means is, you know, do you think people like buying homes with high ceilings or with low ceilings? High ceilings, right? So FHA knows if you buy a house built in 1930 here in Santa Ana and it's got seven and a half foot ceilings, if FHA had to sell that property due to your default, it would be harder for them to sell a property with such low ceilings. So here on page 450, two questions. Number one, physical characteristics that a property must meet in order to qualify for an FHA loan are what? Minimum property requirement. The minimum ceiling height for an FHA insured property is 96 inches or eight feet here on page 450. Now, quickly on 451 and 452, there's some building rules on 451 and 452 that we need to know. Of course, at the middle of 451, construction generally is going to require a building permit in order to follow local law, right? You need to pull a permit before you build, number one. Number two, generally, Construction is going to have to be done by a licensed contractor on 452. Contractors on page 452, of course, need to be licensed in California. But you might want to know a couple of instances where you could do construction-related work and you don't need a contractor's license to do it. One example on page 452 is work done by the owner, right? Owner performed work on their own property doesn't need to be done. You don't, if you're doing the work on your own home, you don't need to be a contractor to do it. Now, be careful, I'm not saying that you don't need building permits. Of course, you need to pull permits, but you don't need to be a contractor to do the work on your own home. Another example is work costing under $500. 
Work costing under $500 also doesn't need a contractor's license. It doesn't need to be done by a licensed contractor. So, you know, that's why, you know, small handymen that just do, you know, they repair your screen door, they fix a leaky faucet. You know, generally those guys don't need to be licensed because the work is under $500, but they have to disclose that they don't have a contractor's license to the customer here at the top of 452. Now, I want to sh share with you a couple of architectural styles here on 455, clear through to about 459. You know, there's some pictures here. It's always good when there's pictures in a book, frankly. But I'll show you a couple of architectural styles. Just looking at these on 455, 457, 458, what are some architectural styles that you can see around where you live? Now, depending where you live, you might have, you might, you might have Cape Cod homes where you live. You might have Queen Anne Victorian properties if you live in the Bay Area. But most of us, if you're here in L.A., you know, you're going to see a lot of 458. You're going to see a lot of Spanish, and you're going to see a lot of contemporary, and you're going to see a lot of California ranch homes on page 458. Now, in terms of roof styles, here on page 456, you'll see at the top right of page 456 this term, hip roof, on 456. A hip roof, and you might want to make a little note of this for the exam, I would write the words slopes on all four sides. The architectural style of roof that slopes on all four sides is known as a hip roof here on 456. So again, very commonly asked on the test. The architectural style of roof that slopes on all four sides on 456 is known as a hip roof. Now, I, I know a couple of these other ones also slope on four sides. Uh, you know, the pyramid roof slopes on four sides. But for the exam, the architectural style of roof that slopes on all four sides is a hip roof here on 456. Now, another thing you might want to look at here on 460 and 461 is this concept of orientation. The placement of a house on its site, where a home is placed on its site, is of course known as its orientation on page 460. So, in, you know, we live in a cultural uh, melting pot. We have a lot of people from different parts of the world that live in our great state here. And it's important to know that some cultures might prefer that the front door face west or might prefer that the living area face east, right? So the placement of a house on its site is known as its orientation here on page 460. Now, the hottest portion of a property tends to be the south-facing portion of the home. And you'll see these explained on 460 and 461. But basically, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. You know that. But as the sun is setting, the sun is not arcing directly overhead. The sun is setting through the southern horizon here in California. So the hottest portion of a home tends to be the south-facing portion of a home because it, it gets the brunt of the sun for the majority of the day. And that's why if you look at real estate magazines from Tahoe or Mammoth or, you know, uh, Big Bear or Lake Arrowhead, it'll always say windows face south or, you know, living area faces south because that's a passive heating system that allows the property to be warmed uh, without using the heat as much. So again, between north, south, east, or west, the hottest portion of a property tends to be the south-facing portion of the home on 460 and 461. Now, construction, right? Constructing a home. If you look at 463 and 64, you know that the foundation of a property, of course, is poured from concrete generally. But you're going to want to, builders have to make sure that the property goes through, the land goes through what's called a perk test or percolation test here at the top of page 463. A perk test is the ability of the water to drain through the soil. That's an important thing, that, that's an important aspect of construction that might measure uh, soil stability over time. So if the question on the exam were to say, the ability of water to drain through the soil is measured through something called a perk test or percolation test here on page 463. Once you've identified land that will perk properly, then construction potentially could start once the appropriate building plans have been approved and permits obtained. The foundation of a property at the bottom of 463, the foundation is generally poured from concrete. And you'll see here on 464 a diagram of a typical foundation of a home on 464. You know that the foundation of a home is typically poured from concrete, which is what 464 is showing. Then the home is framed. Typically, houses are going to be wood framed. Large buildings like the one I'm in now are steel framed, but most homes are wood framed homes. The 
frame must connect to the foundation on 464. The frame must connect to the foundation at the sole plate, also called the sill plate, at the top of 464. So the sill plate or the sole plate is where the foundation and the frame meet. Now notice, for earthquake safety on page 464, California building codes require that the foundation and the sill connect using anchor bolts. So again, very commonly asked on the test, for earthquake safety, California building codes Lights off? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can just keep going. Whatever okay. Doing. Yeah, no problem. Uh, restart tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, man. Yeah. So you know that the foundation of a home is poured from concrete, and the frame and the foundation have to connect. Notice on page 464 that the foundation and the frame are connecting at something called the sill plate or the sole plate, right? So the sole plate connects the foundation and the frame. For earthquake safety, California building codes require that the foundation and the sill connect using anchor bolts. Very commonly asked question on the test. For earthquake safety, California building codes require that the foundation and the sill connect using anchor bolts. Then you'll notice on 464 another term called a joist. Notice the joists are parallel horizontal wooden members that support the floor. So notice that the subfloor is resting on joists here on page 464. So again, for uh, when you build a home, the joists are these horizontal wooden members that support the floor load. Now, a lot of people commonly confuse joists with studs. You know, studs travel vertically and they form the exoskeleton of the home. Joists travel horizontally and the subfloor will rest on the joist. So again, commonly asked question on the test. Uh, horizontal wooden members that support floor load are known as joists here on page 464. Now, another term that's worth looking at at the middle of 464 is this term radon gas. Now, radon gas is an environmental hazard, much like asbestos or carbon monoxide or lead paint. Asbestos falls in that same category of, uh, or radon gas rather, falls in that same category of uh, environmental hazards. So some areas are high radon gas areas. That is, as the earth ages, uh, some areas have high radon gas concentrations, which basically means the breakdown of rocks, which may be abnormally high in uranium content, you could have this odorless, colorless gas kick off from these rocks called radon gas, which isn't such a huge problem unless the gas is being emitted in an area that's not properly ventilated. So if my house is built in a high radon gas area and I crawl under my home, maybe I got some storage, I got a raised foundation, older home, and I you know, trip and fall and fall asleep or pass out down there and I inhale a lot of this radon gas, if it's not ventilated properly, that could be harmful or potentially fatal to someone who inhales too much of it. Now, there's an old school potential question you might find on the test about radon gas. And you may want to write on page 464, right next to radon gas, I would write the words measured using spectrometer. Radon gas levels are measured using an instrument called a mass spectrometer. Now, real estate agents are not going to have this tool to check for radon gas. We don't want the tool. We don't want that liability. But if you needed to get an area checked for radon gas concentration, the tool that would be used is called a mass spectrometer here at the middle of 464. Now here's a question for you real quick. Just speaking of joists, you'll notice on 466, you'll notice this diagram of the joist. Notice it's a horizontal wooden member that supports the floor, right? And you'll see that on page 466. You'll see the sole plate also connecting the foundation to the frame on 466. Now, you and I both know that inside of walls, if you pull off the drywall, that plasterboard in your bedroom or office, you'll have studs, right, that are exposed. In between those studs is insulation. Now, you know the purpose of insulation is to, of course, keep the cool in in the uh, winter, or keep the cool in in the summer, rather, and keep the heat in in the winter, right? That's the purpose of insulation, to regulate temperature. The Effectiveness of insulation is measured using something called R-value here at the top of 476. So the R-value 
is a measurement of the effectiveness of various kinds of insulation. The higher the R value, the more effective the insulation. Very commonly asked on the test, the higher the R value, the more, the, uh, the more effective the insulation is at the top of 467. You know the R in R value stands for resistance to heat flow. You might want to make a note of that at the top of 467. The R in R value stands for resistance to heat flow. The higher the R value, the more effective the insulation. Oh, how about this question? Imagine you're a real estate agent and you're showing a property in the dead of winter. You notice that the temperature of an interior wall is just as cold as the temperature of an exterior wall in the dead of winter. Do you think that's a good thing? Of course not. It's not good to have the temperature of an inside wall feel as cold as the outside stucco. What's causing this? Oh, it's an insulation-related issue, right? Low R value, no R value, but it's, it's an insulation-related issue. So again, you'll need to know those for the exam, what R value is. The higher the R value, the more effective the insulation. The R in R value stands for resistance to heat flow. Now, another thing on page 467 at the middle, you'll see the term asbestos at the middle of 467. Asbestos, again, like radon gas, like lead-based paint, uh, like uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, asbestos is an environmental hazard. Asbestos was used, you know, 50, 60 years ago plus in a lot of building material, right? Because it's pretty cheap and it was thought to be very effective at the time. But asbestos is a known carcinogen. So it's, it can be very harmful if, let's say, there's insulation in your attic that, is, uh, that contains asbestos. Maybe you're up in the attic getting the Christmas tree down or getting the ornaments down. It's dark. You bump one of the uh, beams up there in your attic, and it's lined in asbestos insulation or asbestos fibers. If those are released into the air, it can cause health problems. So asbestos is like radon gas, like carbon monoxide, like lead paint. It's an environmental hazard, and it's banned in building material today here at the middle of 467. Now, we'll learn in a, in a little bit here that lead-based paint actually has a year trigger. There's a year trigger where if a property was built before a certain year, 1978, the seller has to give the buyer a lead paint disclosure. There is no year trigger like that for asbestos. Now, it's not like if a property was built before 1970, you got to give the guy an asbestos booklet. That, that rule isn't there. Now, if you buy my home and I know it contains asbestos, I got to disclose that to you. But there's no requirement that if a property was built before a certain year, you need to give them an asbestos disclosure like there is with lead paint, for example. So asbestos is an environmental hazard. Now, another thing on 467 and 468 that's worth looking at is the term ridge board on 467 and 468. The ridge is the highest point of construction on a wood frame building. You'll see this at the top of 468, the term ridge board, very commonly asked question on the test. The crown, the peak, the highest point of construction on a wood frame building is known as its ridge board here on 468. And you'll, you'll see that in the picture at the top of the page. Now, at the middle of 468, you'll also see this term flashing at the middle of 468. Now, you know flashing is metal that's on a roof to prevent water intrusion. So you could have flashing on a roof to divert water away from an area, right? So metal on a roof to prevent water intrusion is known as flashing here at the middle of page 468. Now, on 470, no matter what day you take the test or what version of the exam you happen to get, I can basically guarantee you're probably going to see one question or more about lead-based paint on your exam on 470. And I want to get those questions to you right now. Now, first, what is lead-based paint? OK, it's paint with lead in it, right? So that's bad. Now, it's very bad if, if the chips are inhaled or ingested. So I hear recently there was a report of some cribs, some baby cribs that had come out of, out of, uh, out of Asia. And those baby cribs were found to have been painted with lead-based paint. Now, the reason that's particularly egregious is because what do kids do with a crib, right? They, you know, they chew on it and they suck on it and they bite on the bars of the crib, which can cause developmental problems in the kid. Lead paint is like radon gas, like asbestos, like carbon monoxide. It's an environmental hazard on page 470. So there's a couple, three questions that you might find on the exam about lead paint, and I want to give those to you right now. First is, well, what year 
will require a lead paint disclosure prior to 1978. And you might want to write that down somewhere on 470. Anytime you have a property built prior to 1978, the seller has to give the buyer a lead paint disclosure. Now, let's say my house was built in 1974. I got to give you a lead paint disclosure. Now, what do you think that lead paint disclosure says? Do you think it says that the property has lead paint? No, I don't know if my house was built with lead paint. In fact, the only way I'd know that is if I took off you know, samples of the drywall or paint, sent them off to a lab and had, and had a lab test them. No one does that. So a lot of people think, well, okay, my house was built in 1962, but I don't know whether or not it had lead paint. And because I don't know, I don't have to give the disclosure to the buyer. That's totally not true. In fact, very few people are going to know whether or not the home has lead paint, but you still got to give the buyer a disclosure regarding the hazards associated with lead-based paint. So three questions for the test. Number one, property built prior to what year requires a lead paint disclosure prior to 78? Number one. Number two, this is kind of a tricky one. Property built after what year does not require a lead paint disclosure? Property built after what year? Well, before 78, we need it. Before 78. So after 77, we don't need the lead paint disclosure. So again, before 78, we need it. But after 77, we don't. So again, in 76, we need it. In 77, we need it, pre-78. But what about in 78? Houses were built in 1978. Those homes don't require a lead paint disclosure, right? After 77, we don't need it. Before 78, we do need the lead paint disclosure. Now again, how about this third question? It says, a property was built in 1974. What do we need? We need lead paint. But the seller and their agent had no direct knowledge of lead paint. Like they just truthfully didn't know whether or not the property had lead paint. They didn't know. Based on the fact that the seller and the agent didn't know whether the property had lead paint, they failed to deliver the lead paint disclosure to the buyer. Is that okay? Not okay, right? You gotta give it pre-78 no matter what. Who's liable there? Just the seller, just the agent, or both? They're both liable for failing to deliver the lead paint disclosure. So again, three questions. Before 78, we need it. After 77, we don't. Before 78, you have to deliver the lead paint disclosure whether or not you have any direct knowledge of lead paint on the property. Now, of course, if you know about lead paint, you would also have to deliver that uh, information to the, to the buyer too. By the way, this also applies to rental property. So if I rent your apartment, you got a building here in LA, built in 1950, you still got to give me as a tenant a lead paint disclosure here on 470. Now, on page 471, a couple things here at the middle of 471. First, you'll see the term EER on page 471. The EER is the energy efficiency ratio on page 471. This is used to measure the efficiency of an air conditioning unit. Now that word efficiency is an interesting word because how do you think efficiency differs from let's say something that's effective? So efficient versus effective. Well, maybe a Hummer or a Lamborghini is effective, right? It'll get you from let's say here to San Diego. It's effective, it'll work but it, it's not so efficient, right? You're using a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of gas, right, to get you to San Diego. You know, I'll use another horrible example of uh, something bad, chemotherapy, right, in cancer. Chemotherapy is effective. It'll kill whatever is in its path, but it'll also kill, you know, good stuff. It's maybe effective, but maybe it's not so efficient because there's a lot of other stuff that goes along with it. So effective is it works. Efficient maybe is it works without expending a lot of energy or without a lot of loss. Now, the most common example of efficiency is, let's say, uh, miles per gallon in a car. Oh, I have, okay, I have a Toyota Prius. It gets 50 miles to the gallon. You'd say, oh, that's pretty efficient. It's an efficient car. Miles per gallon is a measure of output over input, right? I get 50 miles of output on one gallon of input. Now, how does that relate to page 471, air conditioning units? Well, how do you measure the output of an air conditioning system? Well, you'd measure it in BTUs, British Thermal Units. That's the uh, output of an air conditioning unit. Divided by input, that's the number of watts of electricity required to run it. If you get a lot of BTUs and not a lot of electricity needed, that's not 
effective, it's efficient, right? It might also be effective, but that's a measure of efficiency. So if the question on the test were to say, middle of 471, the measurement of output in BTUs of an air conditioning system divided by the number of watts of electricity required to run it, this is going to give you the air conditioning unit's EER, or energy efficiency ratio. Now, speaking of efficiency, if you look at the bottom of 471, you'll see the term solar heating on 471. So, you know, solar is a pretty important uh, kind of 2016 topic because a lot of, there's a lot of, I don't want to say litigation, but a lot of dispute about uh, buyers that buy homes that, let's say, have solar panels on them, but maybe they didn't know that the, home, the panels weren't owned by the property owner. A lot of the time, the solar, the solar panels are leased. And if you buy my house that has solar panels on it, you're going to take over my solar lease. So as these solar panels become more common, as you get into our business, you're going to want to make sure that, of course, if, the, if you're selling a property that has solar panels on it, you must determine the ownership status of those solar panels and also make sure that the buyer is aware that they'll be taking over the lease on those solar panels after they close escrow on the property. Now, one thing I want to share with you here on page 473, there's three things actually on 473 that are worth looking at. One, of course, is smoke detectors. You know that California law requires that all properties have one operable smoke detector. Now, your city might have heightened requirements. Your city might require a smoke detector in every bedroom or one on every story, right? If it's a two-story house, you need one on every level, one in every room. But California law requires all properties be built with an operable smoke detector. Another thing is carbon monoxide detectors. 2011, properties now have to have an operable carbon monoxide detector. And of course, water heaters at the bottom of 473, water heaters have to be strapped, braced, anchored to resist falling in the event of an earthquake. The last part of chapter 14, of course, is here on 475 through 478, or 477, really. I wanted to show you or go over this form with you on 475. This is an agent visual inspection disclosure. Now, this form was created out of a 1984 lawsuit called Easton versus Strasburger. Easton versus Strasburger is probably the most significant real estate lawsuit in the last 100 years outside of civil rights lawsuits. What happened basically, long story short, in Easton Strasburger is this guy bought this house for $170,000. Closes escrow, starts to fix it up. Turns out the cost to fix the house was $213,000. It cost the guy more to fix it than it cost him to buy it. The guy's super pissed, sues everyone. Now, out of this case, Easton versus Strasburger, we are required to conduct a reasonably competent, diligent, visual inspection of normally accessible areas in the property. Now, in English, what that means is every time you sell a house, you basically have to conduct a visual inspection. You've got to look around, and whatever looks like it might be off, you have to note on a visual inspection form that's delivered to the buyer. Now, what's scary about this for a lot of agents, and this, by the way, makes your life immediately worse. The fact that you have to do this visual inspection is bad for the agent because now it's one more thing that we could screw up. You know this. If you have a husband or wife or a boyfriend or girlfriend, you're like, hey, I'm coming home from work. Your husband or wife says, you know, I'm hungry. Bring me Chipotle. Your life is immediately worse because now if you mess up that hoarder and they're giving you a task, if you mess it up, you could be liable, right? They could give you a hard time. It's the same thing here on 475 and 476. If you have to do a visual inspection and you miss something, you miss an uneven floor, or you miss a crack, or you miss what looks like a leaky roof, this could create liability for the agent. Now, a lot of people hear that and they say, well, I'm not a home inspector. I'm not an appraiser. How could I be responsible for conducting a visual inspection? That makes absolutely no sense. Now, the truth is, is that the standard of care that you have as a real estate agent is not as high as that that an appraiser or an architect or a home inspector or a contractor would have. If you miss something, the question the court will ask is, would another real estate agent in the same or similar circumstance have made the appropriate disclosure? And in fact, what I love about 475 is if you look at 475, this is all the stuff that we're not going to do. 475 lists all the things that we're simply not going to do in a real estate transaction. We're not going to climb up a chimney. We're not going to climb onto a roof. 
We're not going to go into an inaccessible area. We're not going to open a locked door. We're not going to move furniture around. We're not going to move clothing or take paintings off the wall to look behind a painting. We're just going to look around in the reasonably accessible portions of the property. And if something looks wrong, we're going to note it on 476 or 477. Now, if you look at these two pages, it's just got living room, dining room, kitchen, and all these blank lines for the agent to take notes. Now, we don't want, I'll give you a quick example, because let's say that you noticed a small crack somewhere in the property. You're not, probably not going to write, I, I hope you don't, your broker will train you on this, but I would discourage you to write the word small. Because frankly, if you write that the crack is small, small frankly has the implication that it's not a big deal. Could you have a significant structural small crack? You could. So you don't want to say small, you just want to put crack noted in dining room ceiling. Then you want to claim ignorance, unable to determine cause or severity. Then you're going to want to pass that to someone else. Recommend further evaluation by a licensed contractor. So we're going to want to make our observation in a very dispassionate but proper way. But we're also going to want to say that we don't know what caused it. So if it's a, if it's a, a leak in the ceiling, we don't want to say small leak, or we, don't, we, might even want, we might not even want to say leak. You don't know what put that discoloration there. You might want to put discoloration noted in ceiling. Unable to determine cause or severity. Recommend further evaluation by a licensed contractor. So, you know, we're going to want to do our job, but we're also going to want to let them know we're not trained as a home inspector or an appraiser or contractor, and they should engage the services of someone more knowledgeable than us to really accurately determine the condition of a home. My hope for you, of course, is that you get into our great business and make a ton of money and, you know, have a great career in our business. But you can't ever get so busy that you don't do these visual inspections. Someone said, you know, I had a great December. I sold eight houses. Congratulations. You know, I was so busy, I didn't even see three of them. Totally illegal, right? You can't not inspect a home that's required under this Easton versus Strasburger lawsuit. Now, this does not apply to inaccessible areas. It does not apply to commercial property. You sell someone a 200-unit apartment building, how long would it take you to do a visual inspection of that whole building? It would take you weeks. So this is only for residential one to four unit property, and it's only for those areas of the property that are reasonably accessible. So chapter 14, really a chapter on residential design, construction, some key vocabulary. Let us know if you have any questions. We'll see you for the last chapter, chapter 15.